Thank you, Paul. It's really a great pleasure and an honor to introduce, introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Lynn Viola of the University of Toronto. I'll be candid with you, this is a very easy task because it would really take nothing more than for me to list the major books that she has authored and edited, for me to convince you that she's a major authority on Stalinism writ large, and particularly an authority on Stalin's signature policy of the forced collectivization of agriculture. Her first book, which appeared in 1988, The Best Sons of the Fatherland, was a study of the uh, mobilization of urban factory workers for participation in the collectivization campaign. And the subsequent study, Peasant Rebels Under Stalin, looked at the collectivization phenomenon from the opposite perspective that of the peasantry and their capacity to offer resistance. In addition to this, she has been editor or co-editor of Russian Peasant Women, Contending with Stalinism, A Researcher's Guide to Sources on Soviet Social History in the 1930s, and The Redefined Countryside in 1929-1930, which is a collection of published documents in Russian. Most notably, she has been co-editor with the late Viktor Petrovich Danilov and Roberta Manning of The Tragedy of the country, Soviet Countryside, Collectivization and Decoolization, which consists of five documents, five volumes of documents in Russian, declassified since 1991, that present a detailed and very human documentary history of rural Russia between 1927 and 1939. But in a larger sense, it is really not the volume of what Lynn Viola has published, but the way in which she has written about Stalinism that is important to us tonight. It has been said that if anyone is going to take up the serious study of any of the major atrocities of the 20th century, Cambodia, the Armenian, Nazi Germany, it is necessary to develop a so-called thick skin an emotional distance from the scale of the carnage, a scholarly detachment from issues that, if considered in human, purely human terms, would be horrific. Fortunately for us, Lynn Viola has never followed this advice, and she is, to extend the metaphor, one of the thinnest skinned scholars I know. By this, I mean that she regularly deals with phenomena whose victims number in the tens and hundreds of thousands, millions in the aggregate. Although she does this, she never loses sight of the fact that behind every statistic, behind every single digit, lies a human life wantonly destroyed. A father taken from his loved ones, children arrested for some innocuous offense, the destruction of whole families whose only crime was to believe the wrong thing at the wrong time or even to have a tin roof when their neighbors still had thatch. She writes with passion, to be sure, but it is a passion that never degenerates into emotionalism. Her evidence leads us to moral conclusions, but she herself not, never indulges in simple moralizing, and she uses her sources with a rigor and integrity that leads her, and in time forces her, to put forward controversial interpretations rather than seek safety behind a comfortable uh, received consensus. Her lecture tonight is entitled The Other Archipelago, Stalin's War Against the Peasantry. Please join me in welcoming to Oregon State University, Professor Lynn Viola. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I think that's me. Okay, if I don't strangle myself, I will attempt to give a talk. Um, don't what? Okay. Uh, in his classic work, The Gulag Archipelago, 
Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote of the vast network of concentration camps that Stalin built to house the enemies of the people, so-called. These were institutions of slave labor and isolation where millions died. Yet there was another archipelago of the Gulag, a peasant archipelago, that developed in tandem with the concentration camps. This archipelago existed beyond the gaze of foreign observers and long remained hidden from historians. Even Solzhenitsyn could only hint at its existence. But it was vast, stretching across the enormity of the Soviet Union's empty hinterlands. This archipelago of the Gulag was an internal diaspora of peasant families, the so-called Gulag, liquidated as a class in the early 1930s during Stalin's forced collectivization of agriculture. These families were forcibly uprooted from their homes and villages and deposited in the desolate open spaces of the far north, the Urals, Siberia, the Far East, and Kazakhstan. In 1930 and 1931, the high point of the peasant deportation, the Soviet regime sent close to two million people into internal exile, counting for the largest contingent of prisoners in the Soviet Union through the mid-1930s and the single largest deportation of the entire Soviet era. They were called Spetskirsuyens, or special settlers, a terrible euphemism, cast in layers of secrecy, deceit, and human cruelty. The euphemism cloaked the reality of their true status as prisoners and forced laborers to the extraction of the Soviet Union's natural resources, uh, so crucial for industrialization and hard currency earning exports. From out of the wilderness, they built their own special settlements, small villages, perhaps as many as 2000 in 1930 and 31, where they would live, work, and in all too many cases, die. This was the first mass deportation and use of forced labor of the Stalin era, setting the precedent for and marking the beginning of the rise of the Soviet secret police as a vast economic empire and a state within a state. The policy on special resettlement was part of the liquidation of the Kulak as a class that accompanied Stalin's revolution from above in the late 1920s and early 1930s. The Kulak was perceived to be a deadly enemy in Bolshevik eyes. Yet in truth, the Kulak was difficult to define and identify. In theory, he was a wealthy peasant who exploited hired labor in the village and generally played the role of capitalist. In fact, this was an application of Marxist categories onto a village scene which was in many ways pre-capitalist and not at all amenable to Marxist class categorization. When the Communist Party embarked upon the policy to liquidate the Kulak as a class in 1930, uh, the Kulak became an amorphous figure, and the label could be applied to wealthy peasants, peasants who seemed wealthy because they had large families, uh, rural dwellers with an unsavory past, and in general, any peasants who criticized state policy and especially collectivization. Decolocalization was, in fact, a very arbitrary process and always a repressive one. So when I use the word kulak, uh, please imagine quotes around the word because we're not talking about true rural capitalists. Um, Decolocalization consisted of the expropriation of peasant properties and the expulsion of peasant families from the village. I think I'm off of mic now. Can you still hear me? Uh, let, let me get rid of this because it's really a bit of a distraction. Okay, can you hear me at this point? Okay, I haven't lectured in two years, so I will try to stretch the vocal cords. Um, roughly five to six percent of the rural population was considered by the Soviet Communist Party uh, to consist of Kulak. So we're talking uh, of a grand figure of some five to six million peasants. Kulak dumb, uh, as a category, was divided further into three different uh, subcategories. The first category 
was considered to be the counter-revolutionary aktiv, the most dangerous element. And there were, according to the preliminary plan, the figures got larger in fact, but according to the preliminary plan, 60,000 kulaks were in this category. Uh, their fate uh, was the most severe of the three categories. The heads of households, and we're talking mainly men, uh, were subject either to internment in a concentration camp uh, for an undefined period of time, uh, or they were subject to execution. And in 1930 and 31, some 30,000 people will be executed as kulaks. And these are mostly heads of households, so we're often talking about very elderly men who presided over large households. Their families, in the meantime, uh, would be expropriated, their property would be taken away, and they would be sent into internal exile to the special settlements. The second category, uh, which according to the initial plan, and again it changed later, uh, was some 150,000 families, and these families as a whole, who were considered slightly less dangerous than the first category, were subject to deportation to the special settlements. The final category was the largest category, uh, and these were considered the less dangerous uh, or the least dangerous kulaks. Uh, and in general, these people uh, were simply resettled beyond the borders of the new collective farm. Um, over time, most of them couldn't make a go on what was usually poor land, so they drifted away to the cities where jobs were plentiful. This was a period of rapid industrialization. Uh, and if they didn't drift away in time, then the next round of decoolization, in which there were categories, uh, they would be taken up and then sent to the special settlements. Now, decoolization coincided with collectivization and the rapid industrialization of Stalin's first five-year plan. In 1930, decoolization was used as a kind of cudgel to intimidate the rest of the peasantry into joining the collective form. So, in other words, I'm an organizer who comes out to the countryside and I say, do you want to join the collective forum? Well, probably your answer is no, I don't want any part of it. Well, in that case, maybe you're a kulak and you can be deported. Well, then you'll change your mind very quickly. Uh, and so, there's just no doubt that um, the policy was used as a way to intimidate peasants into joining the collective forum. Uh, Stal the Stalinist leadership decided to remove families deemed socially dangerous from the village and to use them for the purposes of industrialization. And it's important to note that industrialization occurs at this period under emergency conditions, in an atmosphere of crisis and fears of capitalist encirclement, so that there was a military imperative, whether real or not, to industrialize as rapidly as possible. Yet in order to extract the natural resources, the raw materials so necessary for the industrialization effort, it was necessary to provide massive sources of labor in remote areas, very remote areas, where it had proved impossible to maintain a permanent source of labor. Uh, so in a sense, collectivization and decolonization was fortuitous because it provided this source of labor that could be sent uh, where it was needed. Uh, and the idea was to create uh, self-supporting penal villages where families uh, would work in agriculture uh, and in, and in, in the industry. Um, but working in agriculture would allow them to, in a sense, support their own prisons, their own penal institutions. Uh, and it was thought that this would be a, a much more economical way to intern people. Uh, both Stalin and Yaga, the, the head of the secret police, believed that they were losing a lot of money with the concentration camps, which at this point were proving very unproductive. So, therefore, special settlements become an answer to this problem. Uh, and the special settlers would work mainly in forestry, selling logs, floating logs, uh, for timber exports to compete with Oregon timber, um, and also uh, in mining. Now, the solution proposed, that is, forced labor, colonization, penal labor, uh, was not a new solution. Penal labor had been used since Peter the Great. But what was new was the scale, the violence, and in particular, the in ideological imperative of class wars. 
Until the 1990s, we knew almost nothing about the fate of the Kulaks after collectivization and decolonization. Research on the topic would not have been possible before the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 and the partial opening of Soviet archives. Even the term special settlers was forbidden in print. Um, once it became possible to work in archives, um, I combined research in central archives in Moscow with work in the far north, uh, which was one of the key places where kulaks were exiled, particularly in 1930. So I worked in Arkhangelsk and I worked in Volunda. And part of what I want to do here today is share with you some of the results of my research, and in particular, um, some of the voices of the people I encountered uh, in these dry, old, papers in Wollongong and Arkhangelsk uh, cities within God-forsaken territories. So I'll be looking mainly at the northern territories, as it was called. Uh, the northern territories were an administrative territorial unit in the northeast of Russia, encompassing a land mass of over one million square kilometers. Uh, the northernmost territories lay just above the Arctic Circle and bordered the White Sea and the Arctic Ocean. So it was here that the state chose to send over a quarter million peasants, the largest single contingent of Vikulakai's peasant families in 1930. And against this icy backdrop that the special settlers, men, women, children, would build from out of the wilderness, out of scratch, the special villages of the other archipelago. Now, the special settlers uh, began their track in February 1930. In the thick of winter, robbed of almost all their property, poorly clothed, with inadequate food supplies, and of course, in shock from the suddenness of the experience. And I think I cannot give a better uh, description than one that was offered uh, by one of the survivors, someone who was a child at the time. They called us special settlers, remembered N. N. Pavlov many years later when he wrote about his childhood in a special village. Pavlov, who was deported from Belarus, Belarusia to the Urals as a child, described the terrible experience of decolonization and deportation. He wrote, one morning, all the villages of the Belarusian woodlands looked like a stirred up anthill. All the residents, from the smallest to the biggest, gathered at our hut in order to see us off to an unknown region. Many wailed, teens, cried. That morning, father, mother, and we two little brothers got ready to be exiled as kulaks. We were only allowed to bring those clothes which we wore and a small supply of food. They put the four of us, dressed in homemade clothes and locked tea, bath shoes, on a cart with two armed policemen for our guard. And just like that, we left. Everyone made a toss cry for us on the way. The cart set off, and a crowd of villagers accompanied us far beyond the outskirts of the village. Indelible in my memory is our beloved Shari, running behind us for a long time. The dog was gray with floppy ears. She ran for a long time, sometimes stopping ahead of us, wagging her tail, looking at us pitifully. With her dog's heart, she felt a terrible calamity for us and for her. We felt our own helplessness, just like she did. So we left our village. The future was fully unknown and deadened by the feeling of calamity. Mother cried and loudly lamented, repeating to the local activists that our tears would not go unheard, that God sees all and punishes. We rode for a long time. Shari kept running, stopping, and howling, accompanied us into the unknown. I should say, uh, the fact that there was a dog running is unusual because one of the first things that the activists did when they went into the village was to shoot all the village dogs so that they would have easy access into the farmhouses. There would be no outside dogs preventing them from entry. Well, the villagers, including Pavlov's family, were first taken to what were called collection points to await the first stage of their journey by train, generally, sometimes later on by ship, to cities in the distant regions of exile. The trip could take up to two weeks. The conditions were terrible. 
Uh, there were overcrowded cattle cars without even minimal sanitary conditions. They weren't allowed to leave the trains during the course of the trip. Uh, in theory, and according to the central decree, they were supposed to have a two-month supply of food with them to be able to feed the families. Well, in fact, because the expropriation was such a horrible, such a violent pro uh, uh, process, uh, most had nothing. Most had nothing. So hunger began from a very early time, as did uh, illness, and in some cases, death. Uh, again, I would like to uh, look to the archives to give some idea of what things were like. And, and this quote is from a note that was found on the track uh, after a stop by a Kulak train. It was picked up by someone and turned into the secret police and ended up in secret police archives. So some literate peasant wrote, we are being carried no one knows where, 45 people in the train car. They don't let us out. There is not enough water for drinking, let alone washing. There is not enough boiled water. You can't even ask the guards to bring us snow. For what have they thrown us into this dark and stinking car which is worse than a prison? If someone could look into our car, then even a heart of stone would tremble. And they would see such horror that even barbarians do not know. It is shameful to put infants in prison, and our car is worse than a prison. There is no place to sit or lie down. For the first two days, we traveled without any water and fed the children snow. The first stop was in the town of the Exile region, where women and children and the elderly would be left until the weather permitted transport into the interior. Now, keep in mind that these people are going to places that have no roads, that have no highways. Uh, in many cases, they're going to places which are literally only accessible by small boats and on foot. So at this point, only the able-bodied, and mainly men, were sent immediately into the interior to begin building the special villages or to immediately start work in forestry. Now, given the speed of the operation and the numbers that were involved, it was not possible to build enough temporary housing for these families. And one point that I should make is, uh, parenthetically, that because of the speed of operation, there was very little preliminary planning. It was only in April, that is four months into the operation, that a central committee was organized to coordinate decolonization throughout the country. So people were literally thrown to their fate. So people arrived in these cities and they were housed everywhere, in warehouses, soldier ba soldiers' barracks, churches, monasteries, theaters, anywhere they could find space. One official described the space per, per person as smaller than a coffin. Sanitary conditions were awful. There was often no access to clean drinking water, certainly no toilet facilities, uh, and people experienced dreadful cold. There was no fuel to heat the housing. Uh, the housing was often damp, dark. Uh, one man, a child at the time, later recalled waking up with his coat literally frozen to the wall. The food supplies, as you can imagine from what I already said, were inadequate, and there had been no plans on how to feed these families. There was the assumption uh, that the families would have their two months food supply. There was also an assumption that the breadwinner, uh, the man, uh, would start to work and be able to provide part of his rations to the family. Well, the men were very far off, couldn't get their rations back, and the families didn't have this two months supply. So what this meant was that local authorities had to scramble to come up with local resources. Uh, and this was hard, given that the population, the free population, had enough trouble eating, let alone trying to find food for maybe an extra 10 or 20 or 30,000 suddenly dumped into your city. Now the fact that they were Kulaks, so-called class enemies, dangerous aliens, certainly didn't help because they had been turned into a stereotype like many other supposed enemies that need to be excised, they had been dehumanized, so there was no particular incentive to help them. Um, epidemic illnesses uh, began very soon, uh, measles, scarlet fever, in some cases even typhus, uh, and there were especially high death rates among children. 
uh, particularly children under five years of age. Uh, one eyewitness recalled that up to 30 children a day were dying in the small northern town of Cortland. Now again, I'd like to go to the archives to give you uh, a sense of, of what the experience was. Uh, an anonymous letter writer among the settlers wrote what was one of the most vivid descriptions of settler life in this period. Living in exile, he wrote, I have looked at the entire horror of this massive deportation of entire families and I decided to write, to ask you to address your attention to the exile camp near the city of Cotlet. Here is a picture of this camp, 102 barracks covered by straw and earth stretched out not far from the railroads in the middle of a wretched pine forest. Tens of thousands of people of all ages are already settled into the camp, and each day more and more new train loads arrive. In each barrack, 200 more souls huddled together. The crush is horrible in the day, crowding in the space between the bunks, and the night people lie on the bunks right up against one another like sardines in a tin. Many sit on the earth's floor since there is no room for them on the bunks. The three iron stoves are not able to keep the barracks as they should, all the more so since there is a shortage of fuel. The only well cannot provide water for the entire camp. For this, the brook is used where the water is so polluted that tea boiled from it gives off a foam. Each day at the cemetery, several people are buried. People are not used to the local climate. Uh, I should say many of the people coming to the north are coming up from Ukraine and from southern regions of Russia. Many are quite poorly dressed and often have colds and illness. Already infectious diseases have begun, typhus and diphtheria, from the last of which there have already been cases of death. To leave these people in this situation for a long time, this is brutality. A person cannot re remain a person in such conditions. Now, I also have an excerpt of a letter from a doctor, a Dr. Yevedev, who was in the small town of Wolga in the north in the spring of 1930. He wrote, a great many Gikulov eyes are accumulating in Wolga. They will be sent on further north to the most distant, uninhabited, and ruinous places, but they are temporarily housed in Wolga churches, the majority of which have long been closed to believers. There they built bunks and people are packed into the church buildings and typhus is breaking out. Horrors have begun. The district secret police called me in and the chief said to me, if you don't liquidate the typhus, I'll shoot you. I went to one of the churches together with some of the policemen. A guard stood at the church and behind the door groans and cries. They opened the doors and there I saw hell. The sick, the healthy, the dying, men, women, old people, children, and the live ones cried out and raised their arms to us, water, water. I have seen many terrible things in my life, but nothing like this. Unfortunately, life would not improve once the settlers left for the special settlement. Now, in the meantime, while their families were in temporary housing, such as it was, in the town, the able-bodied, mostly men, were dispatched immediately into the interior, and this again in the midst of the Russian winter. Conditions were horrendous, there were major problems of transport, there weren't enough carts or little boats to go on. In fact, the local governments had to quote-unquote, mobilize boats from the local peasant population, mobilize boats and carts, which in, men, in most cases meant uh, taking these carts and boats by force. Um, these men made long and difficult journeys, uh, much of it on foot, and once they arrived, they faced grueling labor, uh, so that frostbite, scurvy, death sets in relatively soon. Uh, the only recourse these men had was to run away, and running away was, was fairly easy. Um, by early summer 1930, some 40,000 men run away. Uh, and by and large, they don't run to uh, their villages, but they run back to the towns where their families are being kept to try and help them uh, in one way or another. 
but their life uh, is just as hellish, if not more hellish, than that of their family. Um, I have several more letters. These are letters that were intercepted by the secret police. Um, one man wrote to relatives back in the village. He said, we are in the tundra, 200 versts from Archangels, where there are only native people. Our work is very hard. We work around the clock and rest for only four hours, only earning only a piece of bread. And we are very bad off. Truthfully, I will not survive. We see only forest and water. Any other kind of life we don't see, we don't know when will it will be over. I ask you to help. And there were thousands of letters that went back to the villages, people pleading for documents to prove they weren't cool off, people pleading for money, for food, for some kind of assistance. Uh, one son wrote to his family back in temporary residence, they tell us that we, they will transport you here to us. No matter what, don't come. We are dying here. Better to hide, better to die there, but no matter what, don't come here. I hear that the children are dying. We are now in the forest, in the water, floating along. Work is difficult. They give us only a kilo of bread and other products are such that one can't live. If you can get personal documents for me, I will come immediately. But no matter what, don't come here. Well, some of these men uh, were put to work immediately in the forestry industry, uh, felling trees, floating logs, working incredibly long hours on minimal weight, uh, rations. Others were employed at building the special villages where their family, families would live come summer when transport became easier, when the weather was better, when uh, the spring mud and water had dried up. But from this point, uh, these men and soon their families were caught up in a web of competing interests. Once they got to their destination, the main institutional actors in charge of their fate became the industries for which they worked, at least in 1930. And so the timber industry was now in charge. Uh, so they faced the question, that is the timber industry faced the question, you know, do we throw these laborers, which we're so happy to have, right into forestry work so that we can fulfill our timber export plan? And that would be the short-term interest. Or do we, as we should, put them to building the special settlements where their families would come to live? And that would be in their long-term interest, so that they'd have a place to live and hopefully would be kept alive. Uh, but the forestry uh, industry, uh, like most industries at this time in the Soviet Union, uh, was very short-sighted and simply threw as many people as possible uh, into forestry work. And what this meant was that the deadline which the Moscow government set for the construction, the completion of the special settlements, that is September 1st, 1930, would not be met. And in the end, it would be women and children who actually built these villages while the men worked as slave labor in forestry. Uh, but where were these special villages? Well, let me emphasize that they were non-existent. The settlers had to build them from scratch from out of the midst of these dense forests of the north. Uh, in some cases, they were able to, be, to make use of old reserves, old tracts of land that the government had set aside for free colonization, that is, peasants who wanted to get their own land. Um, but in most cases, these settlements were quite literally uh, chosen by some official sitting over a map somewhere uh, with a pencil. So they were pencil points on a map. There had been no preliminary surveys. Uh, no one had examined uh, the soil condition. The land had not been cleared. Uh, and these people were simply placed down in these uh, areas. In many cases, they would have to be moved entire villages, sometimes two, three, four times in the next years. So, their first task then was actually building these new villages, and this was a monumental task. Um, they, of course, had shortages of everything they needed, except for timber. Uh, they didn't have the tools that they needed, 
Um, everything had to be brought in from the outside, had to be transported in. And just like the transport of the people, this was an enormous endeavor. Uh, and last on the list of, of, of transport items was always food, that always came last. Um, not only did they have shortages of materials and problems with transport, they had shortages of trained builders. Um, the government never thought to make use of peasant know-how and, and basically tell the settlers, well, build homes like you had before in your villages. Instead, they circulated um, very, very detailed blueprints um, and told peasants that they had to build eight family homes. So these were very large structures, which peasants, peasant carpenters weren't used to building. Not only were they very large um, structures, uh, they were built with different kinds of material. So Ukrainian peasants, for example, weren't used to working with logs. Uh, there was an attempt to use um, local kulaks uh, to help them, um, that is to uh, deport some of the kulaks that were uh, native to the region to these villages, but it, it never worked totally. So what they had to do is they had to hire people. They had to hire skilled carpenters to come in and help. And most often these skilled carpenters um, and foremen and other free workers uh, that were used in the villages uh, were extremely frustrated. Uh, either they became like the officials and resorted to violence to make people work, to try to make things happen, materialize out of nowhere, uh, or they were frustrated and wrote letters to officials saying, we can't do this work if you're not going to feed our laborers. Or if we leave the structures as they are, they're going to collapse with the first snow. Well, the families began their journeys in the summer, and as you can imagine, they arrived to find very little built in most cases. Uh, one woman, a former special settler, recalled landing in a wild and deserted place. Cold set in before adequate housing was available, so most people built uh, lean-tos, uh, and uh, makeshift kinds of dwellings, and in some cases lived in those for the next two years. They also arrived uh, too late to plant much, uh, and in any case, they had suitable answers. Um, and if the land was suitable for agricultural pursuits, it generally took a couple of years to get things going. Um, the able bodied were given impossible work norms and industry. Uh, work norms that they couldn't possibly fulfill. And in fact, we know from the memoirs of the survivors that it's not just the able-bodied adult males that are working in forestry. At some times, in some cases, it's the entire family. The entire family will be working. And if there are little ones, uh, and little ones are even five or six or seven, they'll be sent to beg if there's any village nearby. Sometimes they'll be sent long distances away to beg some free peasants for food, for a piece of bread. Because the food supply issue was never adequately resolved. Uh, each six months, every six months, there was a makeshift solution. Local governments would decide on different ways to feed these people. Um, and most often, if they fed them at all, it was uh, a hunger norm, some, a so-called hunger norm, which was just enough to try to keep them going. The settlers themselves would never be able to grow enough on the bad land where they lived, uh, so food was a continuing problem, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, along with food, clothing, medical supplies, uh, and specialists, people like doctors and dentists, all of this had to be brought in from the outside, uh, and it was damnably difficult, uh, and in most cases, uh, they simply didn't have access to medical health, to hospitals. Uh, typhus epidemics will hit hard through the countryside uh, in the fall of 1930, continuing into the winter, and this, of course, will take many people. The situation gets so bad in the north uh, that there is uh, a whole movement among the settlers to at least send their children home. And so if you look at secret police documents, um, not that you will, but if you look at police secret documents, there is a whole debate going on uh, among the police uh, at, about the age limit. Who should we allow to go home? 
Uh, well, the most liberal say anybody under 14. Uh, in the end, the head of the secret police, Yaga, the crosses that out and says people under 10 years old. Now, to add insult to injury, uh, these families were supposed to pay the cost of the transport of these children back to their villages. Um, and they also, of course, had to send somebody to accompany the children. Their many were literally babes in arms, and so sometimes they would attack some elderly peasants who also were simply facing death if they didn't leave. So the elderly peasants would, would be the nursemaids getting these people back to the villages. In all, over 35,000 children will be sent home from the north. But in the meantime, over 21,000 people will die in this first year. And the largest percentage of deaths are, of course, children. Children and the elderly. And let me emphasize that I'm looking right now only at the north. So this does not encompass losses in other regions. Now, because the situation is so terrible in the Northern Territories, the region that was really going to be, in a sense, the capital of special settlement, the central government will rethink the plan. And in 1931, the geographical uh, loci will move from the North to Siberia and the Urals. And these will become the major areas of Kulak's exile. And in fact, they'll have uh, many hundreds of thousands more kulaks, so-called, in these regions by 1932, 1933, than were ever in the North to start with. Uh, in general, again, it took several years before planting uh, began. In the meantime, before the settlers were hardly on their feet, a major famine struck the country. Some of you may have heard about the Ukrainian famine of 1932, 1933, a famine that may have taken as many as five to seven million lives. Uh, the famine was not only in Ukraine, it was also in many other parts of the Soviet Union, and it hit the special settlements very hard because these people were already in a weakened state and they had no reserves, they had nothing to fall back on, and the last people that were going to be uh, given supplies in these territories, of course, were the so-called uh, aliens, the class aliens. So in the north alone, some 14,000 people will die during the famine, leaving 25% of all families without any able-bodied laborers at all. So nobody who can go out and work uh, and make a living. The uh, estimate for the numbers of deaths caused by this famine and the epidemic illnesses that accompanied it throughout the Soviet Union uh, in the special settlements was a quarter of a million. So a quarter of a million people will die in 32-33. Now, in the next years, the number of special villages will decline steadily, uh, both through mergers of villages when they become too small, and closures uh, when the population uh, simply dwindles down to nothing. Uh, in many cases, villager, villages will be left with only women, elderly, and children. Uh, the men often ran away. The borders of this other archipelago were in fact very porous. So people ran away, and in most cases they didn't simply run and leave, they, they tried to send money back to their families, they tried to help in some way. There are cases when they come back secretly and take their families out of exile and then live basically underground for the rest of their lives. Uh, there were people who had been children uh, as, special as special settlers who only began to tell their own families, their own children, that they had been kulaks and deported with the fall of the Soviet Union. That is, until the fall of the Soviet Union, they were frightened to talk about their experience, about probably the most central element in their own history. It was only in the mid-1930s that the birth rate began to exceed the death rate in these villages. Uh, and over time, the state started to uh, rehabilitate to use the official word 
that is restore civil rights to some of these families. Um, in 1935, there were selective rehabilitations, um, but it was made very clear that a, a family could be rehabilitated, that is, they could be given civil rights back. Uh, didn't mean a heck of a lot, but they still were not allowed to leave. They were still fixed to the territory where they had been exiled. Uh, in 1942, the state, of course, is at war. And it is desperate for cannon fodder, for manpower. And so finally, they turn to the special settlers and they say, okay, we can draft, we can recruit the special settlers. Uh, special settlers who are then drafted into the army are free, they're rehabilitated, and their families are as well. So if on the eve of World War II, the special settler population that was made up of kulaks declined from some uh, 2 million to 930,000, uh, by the end of the war, there were a little over 600,000. Now, if you're trying to figure out numbers in your head, which I hope, I sincerely hope they're not, um, keep in mind that every year through the 30s, more people were sent, more people classified as kulaks were sent into this other archipelago. So, to use Solzhenitsyn's uh, apt metaphor, uh, the seas were constantly in motion in this archipelago. Uh, special sad settler status was only removed uh, from these families in 1947, but even at that time, they still had to stay fixed. Only in 1954 were people allowed to return home. And they were allowed to return home, this is one year after the death of Stalin, they were allowed to return home um, only because they, the secret police had come to the conclusion that the people who were in special settlements were now firmly rooted and weren't likely to go home. So it wasn't a humanitarian reason. Earlier they assumed if they let them go, everybody would leave. It was only in the 1990s that this population was fully exonerated. That is, that the state admitted that what had happened to these people was a crime. So the special villages of the North never became the self-sufficient farming and labor colonies envisioned by the secret police. Uh, it was to a great extent an economically irrational policy. More money was put into these settlements in an attempt to transport food. Um, building materials, tools, even animals um, that in fact came out of these uh, settlements in the form of produce or labor. Um, the enormous cost of the, of the operation simply mitigated against uh, any profitable exercise in forced labor, which after all is never very profitable to start with. Nonetheless, Special resettlement policy would allow for the isolation of, so, of the so-called enemies of socialism, putting them to work under the rationale of socialist re-education through honest labor. Now, in later years, as the Kulak population declined in the special villages, there would be a new population that would be sent in. And these would basically be so-called enemy nations. Uh, there would be deportations of entire nations of people within the Soviet Union, uh, and they go to special settlements by and large. So, for example, Koreans living in the Soviet Union, Poles, Germans, uh, once uh, the Nazi Soviet pact was made and the Soviet Union moved into the Baltics, there were deportations from the Baltic countries, then during the war there were deportations, uh, the English, the, che the Chechens, uh, and uh, somebody said something like 58 different nationalities in all. Uh, so the special settlement didn't go away. Uh, to sum up, the creation of the special villages were the foundation of the Stalinist system of forced labor and concentration camps. They constituted a parallel gulag to that with which we are more familiar, the gulag of Solzhenitsyn described so eloquently. They also contributed in an essential way to the expansion of the secret police, uh, the birth of the Stalinist police state. 
Now, to conclude, um, I just want to say a few um, words of comparison, uh, if we can be so bold as to compare this experience and the experience of the Gulag in general with the Holocaust. If I didn't do so, I think I would be failing in my, my purpose here. Um, can we compare the special settlements, Stalin's Gulag, in any way with the Nazi concentration camps and the experience of the Holocaust? Well, there were no doubt a range of similarities. Both societies engaged in what some scholars consider a feature of modernity, population politics, as they are so innocuous, innocuously called, uh, social engineering, the gardening state, a weeding out of undesirable elements in an attempt to shape society, to make populations homogenous. In both of these cases, in the most barbaric ways imaginable, and maybe not even imaginable. Uh, in both cases, there were very strong interventionist states. Both, uh, in both cases, the mass of repression arose at a time of crisis, and of course, in the aftermath of the legitimized and sometimes glorified violence of the First World War. But the differences, in my opinion, are greater than any similarities. Uh, and here I'll turn to the words of the great Primo uh, Lisi, an Italian Jew who survived Auschwitz uh, and lived to tell of it in his masterful memoir. Um, the first quote that comes from Lisi is, the principal difference lies in the finality. And I, I think this is a very profound quote. Uh, the Nazi camp were not just concentration camps, there were extermination camps, there were death camps, with the explicit aim of physically destroying European Jewry and other smaller suspect populations. However brutal and however often the Soviet camp experience ended in death, death, death was not the aim. It was not the main aim. Instead, it was isolation of enemies and exploitation of labor. Finally, one more Levy quote, which I'll end with, and I, I will comment on, but you can think about it. Uh, Levy wrote, it is possible, even easy, to picture a socialism without prison camps. A Nazism without concentration camps is instead unimaginable. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. And of course, it's, it's something that we think of immediately from the Nazi experience. Um, I think overall, the villages uh, supported the Kulaks once they saw what was happening to them. But there is no doubt that there were individuals uh, who helped the workers or the communists um, or uh, who came in to, to actually be Kulakites. There were people who said who the Kulaks were. Uh, there were people who helped um, the officials sort through the tax records of the local Soviet to figure out who has a certain level of wealth, who pays a certain kind of taxes. Um, so there were people, uh, there were people who collaborated, so to speak. Um, the problem is uh, my field has not studied this question. Um, and they haven't studied it largely for po political reasons. For a very long time, it was very hard to say that there was social support for Stalinism, particularly in the village. Um, it's also a very hard question to research. Um, I've tried to do this myself. Um, and one thing that I, I can say with some accuracy is that if you look at the violence that occurs in the countryside during collectivization, and there is a lot of violence, um, the largest number of people who were 
murdered, assassinated, or beaten up, where their homes are burned, are not these police agents from the outside, they're local activists. So something's going on in the village. Yes? Perhaps the only maybe centralized side of the Holocaust was that there were so many cases of people who risked their lives and their families' lives and everything to help to escape. And uh, I wonder if there were tensions like that around. Well, there were The question was, if, if, I, if I've heard it right, um, there were so many cases when people helped Jews during the Holocaust. Was there something similar in the Soviet Union? Um, I, I rather doubt the premise <laughs> of your question, with all due respect. Um, and I think there were amazing people who did help, but that they were so incredibly small in number. Uh, I think probably there were larger numbers in the Soviet Union to help the Kulak, simply because we're talking about a different kind of society. We're talking about a peasant village. We're talking about a peasant village where the Kulak would probably have relatives all through the village. Uh, he probably would have helped some peasants during times of famine and whatnot. So I, I think probably there's, there's a much, much larger number of uh, people who came to the aid who either tried to block the Kulakization in violent riots or who took children into their home or who gave food to these people as they left, uh, or sent food later, or sent documents. Yes, sir. Uh, would, would you agree that uh, the history of uh, the 20th century uh, demonstrates that government has become the greatest danger faced by Western people? Well, certainly in these specific instances, there's no doubt. But if you look at things like, you know, the introduction of universal education uh, and certain welfare projects, um, then I, I think governments can be wonderful institutions. So I, I, I think that you have to look at a whole series uh, of factors when you make a judgment about intervention, interventionist government. And you have to look at the context, you have to look at the time, and you have to look at ideology. In, in these two instances. In, well, yeah, I mean, there, there are genocidal regimes, but I, I guess what I'm saying is I wouldn't make the case that all government intervention is bad. For example, governments have intervened by creating uh, um, hate laws, so-called, like we have them in Canada. I mean, that's a very good thing, that, that helps people. Um, 
I have examples of, of very large groups and of, of large groups um, where there were no men uh, because the men were in concentration camps. And so if there was one man or a couple of men, they led them out. Mostly they were caught. Um, in terms of entire villages, no. But what I do have are cases when people refuse to get off the train. Uh, uh, when people refused to continue on the track. Um, there were also revolts within the villages. And these were, these were sometimes organized with the, the idea of escaping. The escape didn't occur. Uh, but in a couple of cases in 1931, uh, the revolts were quite organized and they encompassed a number of special settlements and they were put down with a great deal of bloodshed. And it was at this time, in fact, that the secret police took over the entire operation from these local industries. Yes? Yeah, this is a great question, and it's also a hard question. The question was uh, whether I have any idea of how these families now, the survivors, the people who were children, uh, quickly dying off, um, how they identify themselves. And uh, I'm now working on this issue in the last chapter of my book um, and having a heck of a lot of, of trouble with it. Um, but from the limited evidence that I have, um, people always identified themselves as Kulaks, even if at some point they were able to leave the villages um, and go on to college. Um, interestingly enough, many of these people became teachers, school teachers. Some of them stayed in the village, some of them went to cities. Um, but as much as, as on the outside they played the role of good Soviet citizen, they spoke the Soviet tongue, uh, on the inside these experiences just didn't go away. And as I said before, I have any number of cases uh, where very elderly women in the early 1990s tell interviews, you know, I, interviewers, I never talked about this before. Um, I didn't even tell my children. One woman said, you know, I waited until Yeltsin published that law before I said anything to anyone. And, and this was very problematic in, in certain cases because people couldn't get pensions unless they were able to submit all their official information, at least for those years that they had worked in the special settlement. So it's a good question, but it's difficult. I, I think they never lost that, that identity by and large, but I can't speak for the whole mass. Yes? Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question. And, and there certainly are continuities. Um, penal labor uh, was used, particularly in these distant areas, uh, from early times. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, Siberia always has that reputation, but it wasn't just Siberia, it was the Urals and elsewhere. Um, so there was that precedent all the way through. And in the 1920s, the Soviet government began to talk about doing the same thing. They weren't talking about pull-offs, but they were talking about, you know, making some quote-unquote rational use of their prisoners. Um, and increasingly, they started to talk in terms of colonization. So not only putting these people in mind, but colonizing the whole area. So when the pull-offization arose, it was fortuitous. It gave them that massive labor supply, but there were definitely continuities um, because these areas were hard um, places and it was hard to keep a labor force in these areas. Uh, there were also continuities in just the inefficiency and the chaos, uh, not only of the process that I've described, but of everyday life and work on the job. Yes? Um, this is also a very interesting question. Um, the documents, of course, you know, people couldn't see the documents, they were classified. So you could use that word, special settlement. Um, although they did try and keep the word famine out of even the documentary record in 1932-33. And I get it only through local, uh, provincial officials who do use the word. Um, I think that we were all amazed to see how good the documentation was. Um, you know, everyone would always say, you know, the Nazis were so good at keeping documents, the Russians would never have done that. Well, they did do it. And I, 
the question to a very senior Russian historian. I said, you know, why? Why did they keep this? Wouldn't you think they'd get rid of it? Well, he said, one, many of them believed in what they were doing. That's important. But two, if they had any doubts, they didn't want to be responsible. So they wanted to have a documentation that said such and such a person ordered such and such an instance. Um, having said that, you know, it's very rare that you can follow a trail all the way up to Stalin. Sometimes you can, but it's rare. Uh, yes? Yeah. Always, yeah. I don't know what the significance of the polka dot shirt is, except that it was probably manufactured in the city. This would be my guess. So it wasn't homespun kind of material. And the reason you don't see women, and I think you probably already know this or guessed it, is because women often were not politicized. Uh, they, they were considered backwards and ignorant. So how could they be kulaks? You know, they, they were kulaks only by virtue of their relation to some man who had that appellation. Thank you very much.